What's up y'all, it's a Fuego. Today we're gonna get to some image classification. This is the sixth video in an eight part series on Python libraries for data science and machine learning. If you haven't seen my first five videos on data processing basics and virtual environments, definitely check those out. But today we're gonna be talking about Scikit-Learn, a library that provides a collection of machine learning algorithms that can really speed up development. Over the years, many Python frameworks have been developed to make the creation of machine learning systems easier. Scikit-Learn was an early framework developed for this, initially released in 2007. It's CPU based and defines many machine learning algorithms that are essentially plug and play. Rather than getting into the basis of the library, because I think at this point y'all understand how to read documentation, we're going to build an end-to-end -end image classification system using Scikit-Learn. We'll first talk about loading our data sets, one of which is built into Scikit-Learn, and one that will define ourselves from raw data on disk. Then we'll talk about the model design for a generic classifier and discuss how training works for this type of classifier in Scikit-Learn. Then we'll talk about improving our training results by tuning our hyperparameters. And if you want the code for this video, it'll be at this link, which is also in the description. Let's get into it. My, my. Let's first talk about loading the datasets. Scikit-Learn is available in Python with the sklearn library. The sklearn.datasets module contains a bunch of useful functions for dataset loading and pre-processing, including the fetch openml function, which allows us to load datasets like the MNIST dataset, which we'll be using today. The MNIST dataset contains grayscale images of digits ranging from zero to nine. We'll also do some pre-processing with standard scikit-learn functions and store the dataset in a single matrix of vectorized images and a vector of class labels. The MNIST dataset is honestly pretty boring, only including black and white Numbers. Let's also include a more interesting data set. The Leeds Butterfly dataset is a dataset containing about 800 images of butterflies and their common names, as well as other descriptive information. We'll download a zip file of this dataset and then unzip it into our collab environment. If we look at the README, we note that there are two important file types to look at. The descriptions files contain the names of the butterflies and the images of each butterfly in each class. The file names make it easy to parse the class name, so we'll create a dictionary going from class ID to images to make it easier for data loading. Now we'll create a simple data loader. So the way that this data loader works, First, we preload and transform all the images in our data set. Then we set some parameters related to shuffling and splitting the data for training and evaluation. Then we can define a function that allows us to load each training example one by one. The data loader also extracts features from the image directly because we know we want to use PCA as part of our feature extraction. This isn't normal for a generic data loader, but this is useful if your feature extractor is a fixed algorithm. This is similar to the way that data loading works in libraries like PyTorch and TensorFlow because often those libraries use iterative algorithms. We won't be using any iterative algorithms for model fitting here, but we can still use this data set. Here's some sample usage for loading a few images for display. Now let's get into our model design. The way that this classification system works is that we'll first extract features from our images, and then we'll train a classifier on those features to predict our desired classes. The feature extraction for MNIST will take the pre-processed vectorized images and perform linear discriminant analysis, also known as LDA, on those images directly. For the butterfly data set, we'll first do PCA on the grayscale images, and then we'll do LDA on those first few principal components. We're going to test three different types of classifiers. The first is a simple logistic regression model, which fits parameters that separate each class. In this example here, the two classes are separated by a straight line. The second is a multi-layer perceptron, which is a simple linear neural network. This assigns weights to each layer such that the combination of one layer and its set of weights produce the next layer. Our final layer defines the output score for a single class, or if it has multiple outputs, those outputs could be scores for multiple classes. The last is an ADA boosted decision tree. The ADA boost algorithm works by first training whatever class classifier you choose, and then training subsequent classifiers only on examples that prior classifiers got wrong. The classifier we're using for this algorithm is a standard decision tree, which traverses down the tree finding similar leaves to determine the closest output class. We'll train these as we discussed earlier, first grabbing the processed images, performing LDA to generate features, and then fitting our classifier to the model. Evaluation happens by first transforming the validation set on the same LDA network we fit on our training data before classifying it with our learned classifier. A good sanity check is to make sure that you're doing better than random chance. We see that all of these models do somewhat better than random for both training and validation. This indicates that we're learning something. The decision tree seems to overfit, but both logistic regression and the multilayer perceptron seem consistent across training and validation. I'm somewhat disappointed with the low accuracy though. Let's see if we can improve this with some hyperparameter tuning. Now, you want me to be
A common concept in deep learning is hyperparameter tuning. Hyperparameter tuning is a process of deciding which static parameters are the best choices for your models. There are a lot of static numbers that go into the definition of models that must be chosen by users. For example, we need to decide the max depth for our decision trees and the number of estimators we use for the ADA boost classifier. We also need to specify the number and size of the hidden layers for the multilayer perceptron. A common method for tuning is grid search, where we search over all combinations of reasonable parameters. In this example, we found a decent parameter set for both ADA boost and the multilayer perception when classifying two or more classes. We see that we can improve accuracy for the smaller class sets, but it gets difficult to train a powerful model on the butterfly data set when more and more classes are incorporated. While sklearn provides easy to use functions, this is a clear example of its limitations. High accuracy when generalizing is often difficult to achieve with simple models. Thankfully, the last two videos in the series will show you how to develop much more powerful deep learning models using PyTorch and TensorFlow. That's it for this video. In our next video, we'll be talking about TensorFlow one of the most powerful frameworks for developing deep learning systems. We'll also be getting into another computer vision example, this time for image recognition. If you're interested in that video or any of the other videos in the series, definitely like this video and subscribe to my channel, and also hit that notification bell so you're notified whenever I post a new video, which I think will be on Mondays and Thursdays at 12 p.m. Eastern time, if I'm on time. And if you want the code for this video, it'll be at this link, which is also in the description. That's it for this video, and I'll see you on the next one. Later. I don't need the fame And I don't like the games And I don't like the way You want me to be wife now I'm in it for the games